Welcome to Motivated to Lead Podcast, helping you become a better leader. I'm your host, Mark Klingsein. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us for our podcast this week. My name is Mark Klingsein with SEMA Partners. Each week, we interview leaders and they share lessons learned from their careers. Our goal is to help you become a better leader. This week, we're going to revisit a conversation that we had last year with Bev Bahan. She is an expert in the area of board effectiveness. She's written several books. And uh, she has worked with over 200 boards globally, and she has some great insights that she's going to share that will be helpful for new leaders. Uh, She's written a new book entitled New CEOs and Boards. Looking forward to today's conversation with Bev. First off, can you give us just a little bit of your career story, a little bit of your, your, uh, your history? Well, sure. Um, I've had the great privilege, Mark, over the last 25 years of working with nearly 200 boards of directors, primarily public company boards in the S&P 1500, but not only in the United States, but around the world. Um, And my focus is on board effectiveness. Um, You know, how do you take a board that's good and make it great? How do you keep a great board vibrant? And um, at the time I got into this, which was in the mid nineties, Uh, You know, this was before the fall of Enron, and most boards were like a country club, okay? Mm -hmm. It was uh, considered an honor to be on the board. Most boards were selected by the CEO. And, um, you know, we used to have a joke that a board of directors was kind of like the hood ornament on uh, a Mercedes Benz. It looked very impressive, but it was functionally useless. So I've kind of lived through all those changes, and, um, you know, I've had as I say, the great privilege of working with nearly 200 boards um, around the world. And during the COVID lockdowns, I wrote a couple of new books um, about uh, one is called Becoming a Boardroom Star, uh, which is based on interviews with thousands of board members all around the world. And the other book that I think we're going to talk about today is one that's coming out later this year in 2022. It's a book for new CEOs about how to be effective in working with their boards. That's great uh, for our audience. We have a lot of new new CEOs or new up and coming leaders that uh, have aspirations of that in their career. So I, I know this will be helpful. So having worked with uh, 200 boards globally uh, in the last 25 years, what what changes have you seen as far as in in boards over that time? Well, Mark, we could spend a whole um, you know podcast just on that, but you know we certainly saw a huge shift from this sort of country club mentality over the last 20 years, where boards were saying, "Hey, this is a real job. I have a fiduciary duty." Much of that was driven by legislation that came out in, you know, the early 2000s of resulting in Sarbanes-Oxley and various other changes to the stock exchange rules. So what we really saw over that first 20 year period were boards making the shift from what I'll call the country club mentality to a sort of a reporting out uh, mode where the CEO and management and working with the board are largely reporting out. They're saying, okay, this is what we want to do right? And then the board is challenging them and asking them questions. Now, in doing that, the board is fulfilling its fiduciary duty by making sure, you know, that they're not um, going off without thinking through, you know, whether it's uh, return on investment or an integration plan or whatever it is, okay? So they've certainly shifted from, you know, anything you want to do is okay, which is what was going on in the the 90s. But uh, what's interesting is if you ask most CEOs and executives, what does success look like at the end of a board meeting? It it basically goes like this. I got out unscathed. I got out of there, okay, unscathed. And when you think about it, it sets up this sort of defensive dynamic between the board and management. And the shift I've seen um, really in the last five years, I started to notice it, both on the board side and on the management side, we're, we're really the sense of, look, rather than this defensive thing, we want what I call collaborative oversight, and that that should be the optimal relationship between the CEO management team and the board, where, yes, of course, the board is going to exert its fiduciary duties and ask some challenging questions. But at the same time, you want to mine the talent and expertise at your board table more effectively in a more collaborative way. Now, what's interesting, what happened with the COVID is that when you get into a crisis like that, 
boards will shift into an almost micromanaging mode where they kind of roll up their sleeves to try to help the CEO and the executive team to wade through the corporate emergency. So we saw a lot of that during COVID. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting now, now that the pandemic is starting to wane, it's where where do we go back to? I don't actually think we go back all the way to this reporting out mode that we were in, you know, where it's here's our proposal, right? Because we've been operating in this much more collaborative environment. I think we need to scale it back. But optimally, I think it would be great to scale it to what I call collaborative oversight. And um, amazingly, I think the silver lining of the COVID pandemic is it allows many boards and management teams to shift in that direction. So you have a new book coming out later this year. Uh, It's called New CEOs and Board, How to Build a Great Board Relationship and a Great Board. Advanced copies. It'll come out on uh, Amazon hopefully later this year. Great. So what, what do you think the, the biggest challenge is for a, a new CEO working, working with a board? Well, Mark, that is a great question. And um, the challenge is essentially this. I mean, there, there are a number, but um, in your career, up until you become a CEO, you've had a boss, right? And usually by the time you've got to the C- CEO corner office there, you've become pretty good at managing that boss. You know how to manage up really well. Okay. Now you no longer have a boss. You have a group that you're reporting to and the uh, CEO's basic instinct is to say, oh, well, I'll just form a great relationship with my board chair or my lead director. Okay. And that'll do the job. No, it doesn't do the job. You have to create constructive relationship. That's not to say, by the way, that your relationship with board leadership isn't pivotal. It is. It is the most important of your board relationships, without a doubt. But it is not your only board relationship. And one of the biggest mistakes that new CEOs make is not cultivating a relationship with everybody on their board right out of the gates and and putting effort into maintaining that. And that goes to most new CEOs really uh, underestimate the amount of time it takes um, out of their busy schedule as a CEO to uh, build and maintain that working relationship with their board. So you, in your book, you talk about uh, basically three different uh, groups or roles within a board. Uh, You've got the board chair, uh, you talk about champions. And then the, the other one, which I, I don't know if I've heard this uh, preservationists, well, it's, it's really, it's really the, that's the way I define board chairs because very often CEOs will will really focus very much on their relationship with the board chair. And again, I'm not saying that's not an important relationship, but there are two very different types of board chairs. They're what I call a champion. Now, a champion board chair is somebody who their main motivation is to make their board absolutely outstanding. They will make tough decisions. They will call out directors who are micromanaging and things like that. They will be a great mentor to a new CEO. And they are almost very altruistic. What they want is to create a great board and to lead a great board. That is a great source of pride for them. At the other extreme, we have a different type of board chair that I like to call a preservationist. They're not much interested in excellence. Their main uh, motivation is to stay on the board as long as humanly possible, okay? (laughs) They like being in a position of prestige. Uh, They're really into status. And their whole motivation is to try to maintain the status quo. Now, if you are a new CEO, okay, it's very different whether you've got a champion or a preservationist, okay? Okay. And if you think you have a preservationist, it becomes even more important for you to build relationships with other members of the board because preservationists are often very well liked. They go to great extent to sort of ingratiate themselves to other members of the board. They're always the one who's, uh, you know, oh, come over for a drink or they're very social. Okay. And very often when I'm working with boards and they'll criticize the board leader, they'll say, you know, this person can't run a meeting. They can't get the board to agree uh, various things. That, and I'll say, well, it looks to me that maybe we need to talk about uh, some changes to board leadership. And they'll say, oh, no, that would be like shooting Bambi. OK, so, <laughs> so they what happens with preservation is they're very well liked. 
So if that's what you've got as a, as a CEO, don't try to take your preservationist out. Okay. You'll end up in a really ugly situation with your board. Okay. They don't want to do that, but it's preservationists may be well liked, but they're not well regarded. And they are not sort of the kind of board leader that kind of carry the water for the CEO. They're not going to do any kind of performance management with the board. Um, if they sense that things are changing, you know, and the, the mood of the board is kind of against the CEO, believe me, they'll, they'll jump ship even though they said they'd support you. So when you've got um, a preservationist chair and you're honest and say, hey, I think that's what I've got then you need to determine who are the people on your board that really do wield the power and the influence. You know, that's one of the distinctions between power as a, as an executive and power as a board member. Power as executive is often derived from decisions, right? You've made good decisions. You've chosen to exit this line of business, hire these people, invest in this or that. That's where your power comes from. In a board, your power comes from influence because they're all group decisions. It's the board or a board committee making that decision. So as a new CEO, if you've got a preservationist chair, they actually don't have that much influence because they're not that well-regarded. They're well-liked, but they're not really that well-regarded. So you need to figure out who's actually the people on the board that the board members look at to see what they have to say before they vote. And make even more efforts, you should be cultivating a relationship with everybody on the board, but particularly with those with those folks, because your chair is not going to um, have the level of influence that you might otherwise have expected or wanted. So you've been selected as the new CEO. You've gone through this lengthy process. You've talked to probably every board member you've you know met with a number of different uh, different groups. Um, do you think it's a good idea for a new CEO to sit back down, you know, right after they go, uh, they're in the job, they've gotten the the, the title and the responsibility, but do you think it's, it's a good idea to sit back down with those same people uh, after you're in that seat? Mark, not only is it a good idea, it's essential. And the reason was that those conversations you've had up to now, they may have been extensive and time consuming. You were the job applicant at that point. Okay but now you're the CEO. So this is a very different conversation. You are not there trying to convince the board to hire you. They have made that decision. What you're doing is building rapport with your board members as the chief executive officer and laying the foundation for your working relationship together. And one thing I find new CEOs really do not take full advantage of this opportunity Um, You know, you can do it now on Zoom or video conference without even having to get on a plane. What they used to do is they would get on a plane and they would take the person out to lunch or dinner um, in their hometown. And it tended to be a social conversation. And half the time, the board members are like, why did you even bother? Um, A little more structure and um, a little more, you know, uh, thinking in advance about what you want to talk about, because some of what you want to talk about are things like this. What did the prior CEO do well in working with the board? What are some things I should make sure that I maintain in working with the board? What, uh, how would you, how might the board and you like to work with me differently than you did with my predecessor? Um, You can even find out things, what kind of advice would they give you about working with the chair? Um, What do they see as the chair's strengths? Uh, What advice do they have for you in terms of working with the board? You can even find out their perceptions of some of the folks on your management team. So, and and there's a whole range. I mean, in the book, I talk about a whole range of things to think about, but for many new CEOs, um, they either neglect or squander this opportunity. And I think it can give you some great insights. The most important thing is at this point, the CEO, it's one of the only conversations you're going to have with your board members where you're not pitching them on something, right? They've decided to hire you. You're not there to try to get them to agree to a proposal that you're about to make in the board, nothing. And so one of the most important things you've got to do in those discussions is first structure them and second, listen, because you're going to get some great insights. They've already decided to hire you. This is where you want to listen. And this, I think is going to be invaluable. It, It nearly always is if you proceed in that way. Yeah, that's great advice. So uh, in one of the chapters, it's entitled Building a Board-Worthy Executive Team. 
so why why is that important? Well, when you think about it, Mark, um, nobody ever teaches you how to work with a board. You know, whether you're in MBA school or law school or engineering school or wherever you went, nobody ever taught you how to be effective in working with the board, right? People learn from watching their boss and they pick out good habits and bad habits. And if you come in as a new CEO, unless you put your own stamp on how your executive team works with the board, they're just going to continue in the same vein as your predecessor. And one of the things you want to suss out in these meetings one-on-one to start your relationship with your directors are, how was that relationship in their opinion? If they say they want to work with you differently, then that has an implication for how you work with your executive team. Now, let's go a little further, which is, you know, I've done nearly 200 um, board evaluations, okay? Um, And I don't do them with little box checking stuff. I interview people. And I would say in roughly two thirds of those over the last two and a half decades, um, board materials came up as an area for improvement. Okay. And the fact that most boards are now using diligent or some other platform, garbage in is garbage out. And most of these board materials are not well considered. Many executives simply repurpose their stuff from what they took to executive committee. Um, They really don't put a lot of effort into it, but think about it. Your presentation as an executive starts before you ever walk into the boardroom or get on the Zoom call with the board. It starts with your materials. And one of the things, um, I mean, I'm working with a CEO right now, and we're doing this. We're overhauling all of this because they inherited um, an executive team that was providing overwhelming board books. They had had very little training or um, you know, mentorship in terms of presenting to the board. And, and we're doing that because she needs to put her stamp on how her team works with the board. But we're also building skills for them, which are important for them, because if the board senses that your team is providing polished professional materials, if they are confident and capable in their presentation, the board says, hey, this company's in good hands. Um, You know, it builds confidence. If, however, you're giving them sort of cluttered materials that don't look well thought through, the presentations aren't going well, people are reading slides or, you know, who knows what, it doesn't give the board a good impression. And, you know, coming out of the gates as a new CEO, I think that's a really wise thing to tackle because usually it's low hanging fruit and it's something the board will uh, not only appreciate, I think it will build their confidence in you and your team. Mm. So anything else that you think uh, would be important for a new CEO to work effectively with with the board? Anything that uh, mistakes that you see made uh, by new CEOs or what what can they do better? Sure. Well, one of the biggest mistakes, um, and it's often not in your first year as CEO, it's a little bit later on, but I find as most CEOs have kind of been in, that finally they've been in the job for about a year and a half, maybe two years they start to realize like the honeymoon's a little bit over with the board and they start to think about things they'd like to change about the board. And the biggest mistake they decide is, oh, if I could just get rid of a couple of directors or I've clearly got a gap on the board, there's nobody with a tech background or there's not enough current industry experience if I can just load up the board, right? And the mistake they often make is to go to the chair of the governance committee, chair of the board, And not only do they say, I need a tech person, they very often will say, and here's my friend Fred that I worked with five years ago at Bank of America, and he's like the perfect tech guy. (laughs) And the board absolutely recoils at that sort of thing. It looks like the CEO is trying to, you know, get their friends on the board and this kind of stuff. So let's step back and really talk in a larger picture, Mark. It is not true that you cannot change your board as a CEO. I've worked with plenty of CEOs who've done it and have improved their boards dramatically. But the key to the whole thing is what Nelson Mandela once called leading from behind, okay? Where what you need to do as a CEO is you need to understand processes that work, then get the board to buy into and own the process and let it rip. Because if you use the right process, it's going to move you in the direction that is probably going to create improvements. Mm -hmm. But 
you won't be sacrificing your own um, political capital with the board. The board is going to come to that conclusion on their own. So let me give you a great example. Um, one of the um, tools that I talk about in the book is called Board 2.0. And if you're interested in that, you can come on over to my website at boardadvisor.net. We've got just some downloads on that too. Board 2.0 is the best um, board or director succession planning tool I've ever used because it engages everybody on the board. So if a CEO learns about that and then says, and they know that there's gaps, right? They know there's not a tech person and they know that there's not current industry experience, Okay. If they can convince their governance chair that this would be a good idea to do board 2.0, okay, all of a sudden it's being driven by the governance committee. They use the tool. And unless something very strange happens, everybody's going to agree. Yeah, we don't have any tech. We need current industry experience, but then they own it. Sure. And you can move forward in that way with the board leading it because you've led it from behind. So it's really learning about what are the right tools um, that you can use in order to, um, you know, create that change in a constructive way. So is there any pros or cons of uh, somebody being on more than one board as far as maybe outside, whether it's a nonprofit or a corporate board, any, any thoughts around that? Well, do you mean the CEO themselves? Yes, correct. But, okay. So um let, let's actually go back, Mark, and, and really talk about um, should a sitting executive who has aspirations to the C-suite sit on an outside board? I am a huge believer in that. I think it is the best professional development experience you're going to get, especially if you're going to be working with a board, because you, you get that experience of sitting on the other side of the board table. You know what that's like. Now, the first question, if you decide you want to do that, is, and by the way, I've worked with many CEOs that have had that experience before they came in, and they've all told me that was one of the best things that they ever did. Um, so I'm a huge fan of it. First of all, you need to make sure that your own company supports you. So if you're in the C-suite and you want to do that, you need to go to your own CEO and say, listen, I would like to sit on an outside board. Now, part of the advantage of that is if they support it, you know, your own board members may even help you find a board opportunity. Sure. Um, you know, it's not all that easy, as you know, Mark, to necessarily mm -hmm. find a board opportunity. And you have to, if you're a sitting executive and you want to sit on an outside board, it has to be something outside of your industry. So there's no conflict of interest. So it's not necessarily the easiest thing to do, but it's absolutely worth pursuing. Um, and so the first question is, will they allow you to do it? And then secondly, how do you go about getting on another board? And, you know, in most cases, simply getting your CV over to a search firm is not probably going to do that uh, for you. Be really proactive, figure out the kind of board you'd like to be on, and then look to people in your network and let them know, you know, that this is something you want to do for professional development. This is what you bring to the party. Active executives bring a lot to the board table. And um, now I do believe you should only sit on one. So you want to be a little bit choosy, make sure, you know, it's a board that you would get a lot out of and it would be a good learning experience for you. Um, but it nearly always is. Now, this is always the other question. Well, what if my board won't let me sit on another public company board? Um, what about a nonprofit? And listen, not all, um, not all companies like their executives sitting on outside boards. You know, if you happen to be on a board that turned into the next Enron, that would not be a good sure, thing. Sure. Okay. And they also think, well, we're paying you a lot of money. We kind of want your share of mind on our company, not on this other board. And God forbid you sit on this other board and they see how good you are and they poach you to be <laughs> their new CEO. Sure. <laughs> so there are a lot of risks um, to companies letting their um, executives out to sit on other boards. So that's why the first thing you have to determine is do they support that or not? I personally think there's also benefits fits to them. Mm -hmm. You know, very often uh, when I've worked with other CEOs and they've helped uh, get a couple of their senior execs on boards, they go, wow, they're so much better working with our own board ever since they started sitting at a board table themselves. Yeah. You know? yeah, so, yeah. so 
your your new CEO, you mentioned as far as kind of how to work uh, with the board, you figure out there's gaps and you you talk about improving the processes so that it's kind of something that they discover on their own. But say you're a new CEO and, and there's some glaring issues uh, your first year, do you, do you recommend people just kind of waiting to, to work through those processes or is there, how do you influence as far as board change that maybe is, is, uh, is needed? So the, the best process to create constructive board change is a board evaluation and not some survey, you know, tick the box thing, right? I mean, if, you, if you're serious about it and the way to also make sure that it's not reflecting on you, um, have someone do it that knows what they're doing, where they're doing, um, you know, an interview-based board evaluation, and it should be confidential interviews with all the board. I'm a fan of including the people in the executive team that regularly work with the board, um, that has to be owned, frankly, by the governance committee. So your job as CEO is to get the governance committee to do something like that. And now here's the here's the upside. Um, typically in your first year, while you're building the foundation of your board relationship, it's not necessarily a great idea to start tackling problems with the board. You're, you're right. trying to build a relationship with them. But if there is something glaring, Mark, like you've just said, you know, if you trade on the New York Stock Exchange every year, you've got to do a board evaluation. And I'm willing to bet most of them are these tick the box type mm-hmm. of deals. So if you say, hey, why don't we try something new and you know, I'll fund it and, and this kind of stuff and get them interested in that, that's a way to start that kind of constructive change without it necessarily um, reflecting poorly on you. It should reflect well on you. And what's more, um, you know, if it's done properly, they're, my typical action plans are like at least five things and they really make a difference. And so it's going to create a more constructive um, board for you to work with and probably a more constructive CEO board relationship. Great. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to your new book and you've, uh, you've, you've offered us, which uh, generously that uh, those that are listening and I, I will qualify this, uh, you have to be a CEO and a new CEO and uh, with a board, we, with a board, <laughs> yes. Uh, but uh, we have some copies that Bev is going to provide for the uh, the first ten uh, listeners who respond, and uh, you can send that information. So it need to be your name and uh, company, as well as uh, your your address, mailing address, and you can send that to Mark at Motivated to Lead. Dot com, And then I'll pass those that information along to Beverly. Appreciate you doing that. I know it's going to be uh, a great book for those that are that are new leaders and uh, new CEOs uh, that that they can they can use and, and uh, practical uh, things that they can use uh, working with their board. Uh, so Beverly, can you uh, Bev, can you give us just uh, how the best way to connect with you and learn more about your work and your other other books? And uh, love to to provide a way for them to contact you. Sure. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, well, the best way to contact me is through my website, which is www.boardadvisor.net. We're a .net, not a .com. And on there, uh, you can easily find ways to get in touch with me via email. Um, I answer all my own email that comes through the website. Um, and you can also find on there quite a lot of information like you know, uh, sample white papers of certain things, like we talked about board 2.0. Another thing that's really interesting is called the new director 360, because um, a lot of director orientation programs really aren't that effective. And this was a really cool tool that I created for a uh, fortune 100 board uh, a couple of years ago. So there's a lot of things you can download on the website as well and get in touch with me. So hope you'll stop by. Well, I wish you continued success with all you're doing and your new book that's coming out. And uh, we'll look forward to to reading that. And, and uh, again, thanks for taking time uh, today to, to spend some time talking about the subject. Thank you so much, Mark. Thanks for inviting me. It was a real pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Motivated to Lead podcast. Please subscribe on iTunes. You can also see a video version of this interview at motivatedtolead.com. This podcast is brought to you by SEMA Partners, helping you find your next great leader.